Mary, mother of the church, so fitting. Here she is, the mother of our Lord, of course, marked from the time she conceived him in her womb when the angel Gabriel came to her as we have enshrined in stained glass here, the scene of the Annunciation. And her first step of motherhood was to say yes to God's request of her to be the mother of our Lord. And, and from that moment on, until this day and of course forever, she is our Lord's mother. Like all you moms, no matter how old your kids are, you are still their mother. You worry about them, you stress about them. In fact, I've had a mom say, it's even harder to be a mom of adult children than when they were little. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who are there, you know what I'm talking about. But it's that, that eternal motherhood that she has for her son, who is, of course, all eternal. And then following him, you know, uh, teaching him things, you know, because he was human. We cannot pay lip service to his humanity. He had to learn how to speak, how to walk, you know. He'd fall down and, and scratch himself or bump his head and cry, and she'd pick him up and... All those things, you know. So throughout his life, uh, walking alongside him in devotion, really the devotion that our church now has for our Lord, what we say Holy Mother Church, Mary is an image of the church also. But uh, that's the devotion, that, of course, Mary alone offered. Uh, even after being widowed, when Joseph died, she was always there. And then following him through his ministry, um, beginning in the Gospel of John, uh, the first public manifestation of that at the Last Supper, the first miracle. I'll get back to that. But then all through his life, and, and not just in the good times, but also in the bad times. This, I think, is really the hallmark of motherhood, is even though your kids might have just yelled at you earlier this day <laughs> and treated you with disrespect, when they come home later in the day and somebody said something mean to them, their hearts are breaking or some disappointment just happened and they start crying, who do they go to? And you're there and uh, it's not the time to remind them, well, you know, you were pretty disrespectful. This, <laughs> you know, you just, you just console them. It's sticking by your kids no matter what. And all of you uh, mothers, really any parent, uh, you know, watching your child suffer with an illness and you've done everything you can, but still they're just suffering and there's nothing else you can do but just be there. And you feel helpless, but you're there. And uh, for a child, being a child of a mother myself, the presence is consoling enough. So look at this scene. At the very end of his life, going through such gruesome suffering, such horrible, evil cruelty. I mean, for any mother to see her child being treated rudely or bullied, it just breaks your heart. But then seeing this on this public stage, public humiliation, and there she is standing by him, wanting to look away, but not looking away because that's her son. Standing by him, and with others, faithful disciples, so the women and, and John. And then this scene, Jesus, even from the cross, concerned for his mother, providing for her, woman, this is your son, son, your mother. And that's not just the immediate care of Mary, and John did, did then care for her the rest of her life, but... Um, but it's also, our church tells us, and this is pretty much the foundation of this feast, is he, he put her in our care. I mean, we're called to love and be devoted to her as well as a church. And John represented the whole church. That's when she was given to the church. In fact, also in, in the priestly spirituality, it, when we talk about the Blessed Mother, we often talk about the importance of a, of a priest to have a strong, bonded relationship with Mary because she is our mother too, because we act in the name of her son when we say, this is my body, this is my blood, when we say, I baptize you, when we say uh, what, all, the, all the things that Christ asks us to do in the sacramental life of the church. 
And so I have it right as soon as you walk in the door, a big picture of the Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, I, they, they, it's encouraged the priests even enshrine the Blessed Mother in their home as I do here. But I think it's good for any of us to do that, to have Mary enshrined in some significant way in our home, to remember her motherhood for us, her care for us in the good times and the difficult times. And in the, uh, the, a tie-in here between this moment where he said, woman, behold your son. And, and then it, this scene actually takes us all the way through to not after the death of Jesus and then that final piercing of his side. And we know more from art. It's not described in the Gospels, but if, when they took his body down from the cross, we've seen those images of Mary holding, cradling her, the body of her just departed son as she cradled him at Bethlehem, you know, at the birth. She is there all the time. Well, there's, it's interesting that he calls her woman rather than mother or, or just saying her name. He says woman. The only other time he spoke to her that way was at the wedding of Cana. And, and uh, remember how that scene happened. The family, they're having this great celebration, a wedding celebration, a wedding of Cana. In fact, we have a couple celebrating their wedding anniversary, 18 years today. The Maybreeze, Chris and Maria Elena. Congratulations. <laughs> so, but, but at that wedding, Mary, they ran out of wine. You know, what a horrible thing to happen at your wedding. And, and Mary nudges him, you know, they're out, of, they're out of wine. And he says, woman, that's what he says it. Woman, what concern is that of mine? And then she just looks at the wait staff. She doesn't even listen to her son. <laughs> Do what he tells you. <laughs> and of course then Jesus gets to work but what was his reluctance you know I heard this from somebody who was giving a talk on Mary and he said you know what his reluctance was he knew that as soon as he starts the first miracle that's we recurrent consider that the first miracle as soon as he starts he knows this path is going to end up at the cross and who was the one who nudged him son they need you they need you now, she wasn't thinking of the cross, but she was just thinking of her son in service. I mean, it's like this. A mom who raises her son to, to, to be good and be kind and always look out for others and be generous. And then he decides when he's a young man, I want to be in the military and serve our country, you know. And okay, you know, some of your military moms, military background. You know, you... You know it's a frightening prospect, but you're also proud. You know, I remember my sister crying buckets as her son sworn into the army, and then my nephew, Nikki, and then, uh, but she's proud. <laughs> but, you know, she's fearful too. Well, you know, there's many stories told of a, you know, a soldier who to save the rest of his platoon falls on a hand grenade that fell into their pit. You know, that might be where it ends up because he's generous, and he learned that generosity from his mom. She didn't intend that. But she's proud, even in the midst of that sorrow. That's the kind of experience that Mary had. Son, they need you. You know what to do. And he responded. So she's our mother, too. She stands by us in the difficult times, in our crazy, messed-up world right now, coronavirus and the wound of racism and violence and all the tragedies that just cause our stomach to be in knots. Just turn to the Blessed Mother because she is the mother of all of us trying to call us to get along, to find our way to unity in the love of her son. So may we find consolation in her and strength and, and a witness of what it truly means to be a disciple of her son. And most of it is just tenacity. Stay with him. And when she nudges us, you know what to do.